So now turning to this evening's presentation, I see that uh, Lee Kanner uh, Lichtenberger has joined us. Welcome, welcome Lee. And you have a CV here, which is far too long uh, to read out. Uh, I will try not to do that because we really like to hear you speak. Uh, but uh, a few words, uh, I, uh, Lee is a, an Australian contemporary artist who disseminates her research and artistic vision as an artist at large. Her investigations into evolution, contemporary society and the impact of tourism on island environments has seen you, Lee, do on-site examinations through immersive re residencies or eco-tourism inquiries in places that we'd all love to go to, the South Shetland Islands, uh, Deception Island in Antarctica, the Faroe Islands in the North Sea, the Galapagos, and uh, Lord Howe Island, to, to name a few. Tonight, uh, Lee Kanner Lichtenberger will explore just one of the islands that she has investigated and through her art has raised awareness about the impact that our contemporary society is having on these precious environments. So welcome Lee and I will hand over to you for your presentation. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Um, sorry. Thank you very much, uh, Susan, and congratulations on being the new uh, president. And I want to thank the Royal Society for this invitation and opportunity to speak. Um, I shall go to my slideshow. As you heard, my name is Lee Knar Lichtenberger. Um, and uh, before I start, I wanted to confirm what was already said um, in the welcome to country at the start of this meeting. Um, and I also want to recognise the First Nations um, and also recognise that they have not relinquished sovereignty. Um, uh, so who am I? Okay. Like many artists, I have an eclectic background, no different from others. Oh, Okay, maybe just slightly different. And I wanna take a few images to give you an idea of where my art practice has its origins. And it is in the late 1980s that I'll begin my talk as it was during this time that my interest in environmental issues began. In 1989, at the age of 25, I became the first female refinery plant operator for Shell Refining Australia at their Clyde Refinery in Sydney. I was only one of two female petroleum plant operators in Australia at that time. And yes, that is me in the middle holding the oversized pipe wrench, a trailblazer, you might say, in this all-male industry. And for 13 years I worked here, I'm collecting, among other things, the skills in crude oil processing and production, water treatment and firefighting, along with tickets associated with the job. I currently hold an open boiler ticket, which kind of means I can boil an oversized kettle. A first class steam, which means that I can boil a bigger kettle and then use that steam in high pressure turbines for power generation. Along with a second class diesel and a refrigeration, these combine with other skills I've acquired over time to make my history quite a varied one. And in those times, a life which had begun to question how we were impacting on our environment. I don't remember when I have not been interested in the Australian landscape. I've been creating artworks for quite some time and it is through these artworks that I will explore my topic. Using traditional mediums such as oil paints in my exploration of this world from a bird's eye view, okay, that's more of a helicopter view, has allowed me to embrace the expansive nature of the Australian landscape. As a society, many people have a very simplistic idea of what is nature. It's over there. It's the tree, the bush, an animal, a bird or aquatic life that we don't usually see. And it's from these roots in tradition that I work to translate the beautiful 
with the influence of science to create a discourse about our presence in the landscape. And through these and other examinations, I explore the way which we view the world as object. Initially, I began to use multi-plated prints in a series of artworks exploring complexity that surround the issues of biodiversity, of what we lose when we transform bush to agriculture, or housing in an in, in an intentional provocation to ask, what do we gain? Does the community really benefit or is it perhaps the developers or exploiters of the land that see nothing beyond the financial outcome, creating an imbalanced perspective of our power over the land? It is this abuse of power where humans feel it is their right to terraform any landscape that does not meet their needs or pillage for profit that much of my art addresses. Whilst the government and people in general continue to underrate the real value of our natural landscapes and see them as vast, when in actual fact they are but tiny refuge for wildlife, there'll be no end to the clearing of the natural world, driving many species to the brink of extinction and beyond. I look to create a voice for those who have no voice the, to the individual plight of wildlife. I have used my skills in traditional print media in this beyond memory. This work is an exploration of the human impact and its presence has, and having been, sorry, and its human presence has been in the Galapagos Islands for the past 500 years and the history surrounding the iconic Galapagos tortoise. Incorporating the scientific research that quantifies the Galapagos Islands, its current situation and its history, Beyond Memory uses an aesthetic that engages the audience, the iconic Galapagos tortoise. And once engaged, are provoked to question the use of numerical text and banding across the visual plane. The numerical catalogue relating to not just the Galapagos's physical presence, i.e. the longitude and latitude, but with significant historical dates along with landmass, species lost, invasive species introduction, etc. The banding works to create a sense of a species captured, exploited and ultimately by our very presence, we have driven many to the brink of extinction, only now to become their saviour. With the Galapagos Island tourism increasing at a feverish pace and land-based accommodation increasing from 73 in 2007 to 219 accommodation places in, in 2015, you have to applaud Fedor's travel guide in 2018 for listing the Galapagos Islands as the number one place not to go. Due to the impact, here, due to the impact tourism is having on this fragile ecosystem. In the age of the Anthropocene, my art practice examines how humans impact our world and by their presence and indirectly by their lifestyle. In 2013 and 2014, I had consecutive residencies at the School of Visual Arts Nature and Technology Laboratory in New York. In this place is where science intersects with art and I was assisted by botanists and biologists to develop cross-disciplinary art examinations inspired by Charles Darwin's visit to the Galapagos. I worked on creating metaphors for evolution using the common and tree dandelion and by using my images from the microscopic investigations to extend the dialogue of my artistic voice to construct narratives about life and death. Connections of life is part of a series of microscopic images that examines life's relationship to water. It's our most precious commodity 
fresh, unsalted water wasted in our race of the commodification of all things. In Connections of Life, I ask the viewer to reflect on water and its relationship to this biota. The curling shape of the dead tree dandelion sectioned and stained in its memory of time wraps around one water droplet yet remains out of reach of another, this time the perfect sphere of water. Representing the planet, connecting to the stuff of life. However, you know by the photo that it's already dead. Water will not help its survival now. But what of others beyond our vision acting as a memory, coloured blue, like our deep, vast oceans connecting to our rich, water-rich world, and invites you, the viewer, to bear witness. Produced during my time at School of Visual Arts was Colliding Worlds. It continues this discussion about our connection to all living things in a series of engraved petri dishes, depicting the visions of microscopic cellular examination, text, human DNA, coding and prose to, dis, to construct a bridge between science and the spirit, embracing life and death, science and the history of discovery. By using a, bl a black circular background to allow space and emptiness to surround the work, it appears as though viewed through an oversized microscope, you see the minutia of existence catalogued below. Science and technology continue their creative watershed moments of discovery with little pause to ask questions of consequence and colliding worlds is to act as that reminder of these questions. Transmutation three also forms part of my analogy on evolution using the cell from a tree dandelion, Sonchus carnalensis. By taking the plant cell, which has limitations imposed on it by its scientific classification and expanding on the known, we can have a new examination of our relationship to the natural world. In this transformation, our world, our blue-green planet, is reflected in this guise of the dandelion cell covered with human DNA. And vital to this understanding is that we and all of nature is in flux. This is life in its primary raw state. The building blocks are mutating, infusing our material world, and all life, including our own cellular uniqueness, is being catalogued, not just archived, but scientifically interrogated to be used as building blocks for future research and cellular manipulation. While we continue to see the Anthropocene as a fixable catastrophe and not the reality of humanity on the brink of extinction, we will fail to save ourselves and other species from the impact of humanity's short-sightedness. I mean, humanity may not survive, but the Earth, which Transmutation 3 reflects upon, will in some guise. It will continue to change and evolve, well, at least for the next one and a half billion years. Brian Wallace and Jeffrey Kassner comment, among the many relationships that define the human condition, the individual's connection to the environment is primary. The elemental background against which all our activity is played out. Nature is the biggest of the big pictures. We worship and loathe it, sanctify and destroy it. The pressure of commercialization is increasing and this increase is just a reflection of the pressure our industrialised societies are having worldwide. It is my concern and research into how humans impact islands and other isolated places that is explored through my artworks that primarily engage the viewer in a personal level through smell, sight, sound. Wanting people to not just be told the facts of a problem, but to truly consider the way we, as humans, are terraforming our land. I want questions to be raised and to create artworks which can transform someone's awareness or lifestyle. 
I examine how we are not alone on the planet and our lives require a more holistic view of our interaction with nature. And for my Masters of Fine Art, I created this large installation that exposed the issues surrounding how we are treating the environment, gagging in dystopia. An installation that not only has the reasons for travelling to these wondrous places projected across its surface, but also confronts you with the physical effect of presence has both on site and remotely. And plastics and the importance of this problem along with sea, rising sea temperatures affecting our oceans have become an integral part of my art practice. In travelling to the Galapagos in 2014, what struck me was the way that knowledge of the scientific data was in some ways strictly adhered to, such as washing your feet and shoes to limit contamination between islands. But in others, it was completely ignored in the way our ships refused, our ship that I travelled on, refused to use the government installed moorings. My installation to, towards dystopia is designed to engage the viewer with visions of the islands we hold dear to the imagination, a kind of utopian destination, a water installation that works to connect both the plague of desalination plants that are increasing globally as fresh water becomes scarce, but specifically from the Galapagos Islands to Lord Howe Island, macro and micro consumers pollution that affects our world is examined. When entering the space, you are confronted with the smell. Warmed, heated plastic pervades the space as the tea urn operates as a simplification of increasing ocean temperatures. It works to heat the water that passes from the fish tank, a dystopian snapshot of our oceans with a nod to the phrase that by 2050, there'll be more plastic in the ocean than fish. Passing to the oversized petri dish filled with ceramics based on Favia Speciosa, not a Harry Potter spell, mind you, but a coral that is unique to the reefs of Lord Howe Island and under threat from ocean warming. And this petri dish acts as a trope for the science that created all of these problems and the science that we hope will save our species. As this tea urn warms the water and the water becomes rank, not only with bacteria, but the smells of heated plastic permeating the room, it speaks of one possible future, an inescapable plastic presence with, with the putrefaction of the surrounding world. However, it was my journey as part of a small expedition to Antarctica that I was confronted with a bleak future for our remote and fragile spaces. In the style of the fearless adventurer, I joined a small group of travellers with the not-for-profit group, The Ninth Wave, on an even smaller ship, the Galook. A 48-foot, yes, in real terms, a 14 and a half metre sailing boat to Antarctica. What brave souls we were, or perhaps given the next 19 days, incredibly naive. And these were my travelling companions who varied from a hairstylist to a UN environmental delegate, to a medic, an IT specialist, a New York sound artist, the captain, his first mate, and of course, me. After a six-day day journey that will never be forgotten, we took shelter in Deception Island in its water-filled caldera in the South Shetlands off the Antarctic Peninsula. You know, that sounds really simple, but the reality, really, um, to arrive here, we had no heating, the boom pin was half out, the throttle cable was ready to break, and no hot water, not that showering in the crossing was an option. We headed to the back of this haven, Telefon Bay, and in doing so, we passed by a first of many tourist ships that would disgorge its consumers into these spaces during what was once a short summer. 
Dr. Letitia Wilson comments that the thirst for the authentic propelling the tourist industry is like a yearning for perpetually out of reach utopia. The tragedy being that the tangible physicality of wilderness and the aquatic biomes is fast becoming that very utopian impossibility. And it was here in Telefon Bay that I was confronted with the consequences of not just the tourists, but of our consumer's culture as it washed upon the shore of this once so-called pristine coast. It is what happens to this and other plastics of its kind that's exposed in unhappy feet. This plastic piece was found in the penguin colonies of Deception Island. It is all that remains of one penguin, an unassuming individual that perhaps thought it was getting an easy meal, a fish caught in a net, but the meal had dire consequences and as the penguin had to consume the entire net, there crammed in, filling its internal cavity of this poor creature. The penguin long since dead leaves behind this legacy that creates a visual outline in negative space of its organs from its throat to its anus. In conversations with one of the resident scientists at the Spanish station, who was there for her fourth analysis and, and census of the local penguin colonies, she informed me about the serious population decline she had witnessed over the 20 year period. With many contributing factors, however, plastic and ocean debris were also playing their lethal role in the colonies. Unhappy feet at two metres tall is a confronting reminder of the results of just one piece of plastic in an ocean filled with billions of pieces. My reasons for travelling to Antarctica was not just to bear witness, to observe, but to create artworks that could become something more, something that people at home could connect with. As a science, exploring climate change and polar ice melt is undeniable. It is for the layman just a dry read, full of numbers that may seem to the uninitiated either small, that the seas are rising at 3.5 millimetres a year, or so out of sight that the future 30 centimetre rise by 2050, that they just are easy to ignore it. So I wanted to create a work that explores not just the melting ice caps, but is also an examination of current levels of ocean debris, cumulative distress effect. Consider how our contemporary lives intersect with the natural world. With on-site photographic images can only do so much to give us an understanding of the scale of the problems facing our oceans. And at the centre of this part ephemeral and part permanent work, are six 150 kilo blocks of ice. Each block has been embedded with a portion of the debris collected by me from the beaches of Lord Howe Island, sequentially placing each block into an oversized petri dish surrounding, surrounded by a fishing net. And as each block melts, it disgorges its ocean debris into the petri dish. And every three days, a new block is placed in the plinth of the, in the dish to continue this process. Cumulative distress effect is an artwork that engages head on with issues of melting polar regions in a more visceral manner. Viewers witness the speed at which the block of ice melts as a tangible event, creating a connection between that which is invisible, the glacial melt, and our contemporary time as the melt takes just a few hours. When all blocks have melted and the debris accumulated in the dish, it ultimately creates a visual manifestation of a world without ice and an ocean plastic problem 
that becomes tangible to those who view this work. So I remained with this work for um, a number of days to engage with its passing audience to talk about it. And then one day a lady came and commented and said that all the plastics come from just three rivers and they're all in Asia. She said, I know it as I read it. And I have sort of thought, mm. so I had to kind of dispel her notion and inform her that this debris in this artwork was collected from the east coast of Australia and not the west where we were standing. It was extremely unlikely to be from Asia as the debris would have to travel through the narrow passage of the Torres Strait so that what in fact we were viewing was our own waste washing upon our own shores and that we are unable to pass it off as somebody else's problem. So cumulative distress effect is designed to return the environmental gaze upon the way society uses and distorts its own vision. Antarctica, this ain't no mirage. It is the image of desolation and impact that I also wanted to express. Not just climate change, but also to reflect on the desolation and the changes to the wildlife our presence brings. How the presence of humans in this remote location has left the stain of the colonialist legacy. So how do I take my experience of this journey the conversations I had with the biologists working in the Spanish station and create something that will make a difference, that will bring to light problems Antarctica will face in the future and what pressures it is under right now. My initial reason for travelling there was to create an artwork that would talk about the problems of space, how the actions of one space impacts on the other unseen space. And this melting ice, a snowdrift, this line of white became the canvas for my project. Deception One, Berlin. This work is about deception, not just the name of the place where it was filmed, Deception Island, but of the way we as a society use deception to not see what we know to be true the deception of our governments in not taking strong and immediate action, the deception of the oil industry in creating atrophy about the larger picture of its practice. Deception is just one part of a dialogue, a discussion to create further awareness around how society's actions have a butterfly effect on a, such a remote utopian destination Antarctica in its pristine natural environment is the mirage, a place that one would have thought unaffected by our society, but through this work I show how we are affecting and affecting Deception Island, which by its isolation, its surrounding waters and its wildlife remain virtually invisible to our world. And I want to play it for you now.
with its interdisciplinary eco-critical vision. This work traverses traditionally held disciplinary boundaries between sciences and the humanities. The images loop on a one minute repetition, a loop of video that speaks to the banality and the repetition of our daily lives. But the sound, the sound extends to a three minute cycle. And when the process of repetition begins again, there's the tension of space and time that drives these elements together, a heartbeat of place and connection. The viewer is also confronted with the physical impact we have had in these areas in the past. And continuing with the increasing tourist numbers, there is a sense that time is running out for these areas with voice and body percussion that give the work that elemental sound. The beauty that surrounds people on their journeys to Antarctica are really more ephemeral than one could possibly imagine. So I created this five panel transparent installation or pentaptic called Dissipation. Exposing the glacier of Livingston Island, Antarctica, Dissipation is a work that is a reminder of the places so hidden from our daily lives that we forget the catastrophic fate that is looming beyond the melting polar regions. The translucent nature of the image is a nod to its ephemeral composition and disappearing future. Livingston Island is besieged by the fallout from Deception Island's volcanic activity, which smears the turquoise surface of centuries of glacial accumulation with constant reminders that not only the violence, but the fragility of nature and Livingston, I presume, is a 16-part piece, photographic discourse surrounding our presence in Antarctica and in the Antarctic region. The earliest of explorers would first glint their quarry through a telescope, then venture forth and claim it and stick a flag in it, and then the final outrage is to strip it of all its worth. And this unedited photographic series situates the viewer within the colonialist vision and that point of initiation because what only because what is to follow could only be described as our need to go and pierce in the very corners of our world to claim our territory under the guise of, well, we're just going to go and have a look and embrace the beauty that is there. With vessels such as the Asima Pursuant heading to Antarctica carrying 690 passengers, a new generation of luxury expedition vessels carrying helicopters, submersibles and advanced scuba diving equipment. The glimpse into the expansion of Antarctica as a consumerist commodity and it is, has already begun and in my view it's not going to be pretty. In 2017, some 35,000 tourists visited this remote place. And with the new one day fly in, fly out trips already being advertised for the summer of 21, 22, a return to this spiral has just begun. If we've learned anything from places like Galapagos is that what follows is not about looking after the environment, but of the money made from the exploitation here. One way maybe to change people's vision of how we should be engaging in such places. A number of artists are already working with people in science to translate the academic into the more tangible and connective platform to use the aesthetic to change the minds of those who can make a difference. Collaborations between academic fields give results that can be incredible and can take environmental issues such as this to a new level of community awareness and engagement. On each of my journeys I have taken on the high seas, I have produced a series of drawings called From the Bow. These drawings are what lay ahead of the ship every day and the view that lay beyond the bow, the vista, 
that greeted me every morning, captured as a meditation on place. On my journey to Antarctica, on many occasions, it was problematic to venture on deck to create these observations. So I opted for these in these difficult moments to explore the movement of the vessel instead. As I sat facing the same direction inside the cabin, I meditated on place and created small free-flowing drawings that used my hand as a tool transcribing the roll and the pitch of the boat as the Drake Passage showed our expedition the true nature of its power. I reproduced two of these drawings on my return home to create acts of movement one and two. It was an engagement with the vessel itself that inspired how I was to work on my next ocean voyage. I have just returned from a 30 day residency as the artist at sea with the Schmidt Ocean Institute with their program to involve artists with the science that is taking place. My time was spent aboard the RV Falcor as it mapped the ocean floor in the Coral Sea Marine Park, northeast of Brisbane. Here, I created a mechanical drawing that would map the journey of this vessel, just as the vessel mapped the ocean floor. Gone was my hand responding to the movement, replaced with an object that was that would map movement alone, a more rustic, non-high-tech installation in itself. A piece of graphite, weights and bungee ropes, making marks and recording movement on Japanese bamboo paper. Over 30 days of this drawing, I accumulated a narrative of movement on a 10 metre roll of paper, interspersing blue pencil when we turned and charcoal when we had rougher seas. As the scientists were continuing to map the ocean floor as part of an international program to map the globe by 2030, I was mapping them. When I sat that first day at sea to, to begin my On the Bow series of drawings, I realised that um, I would have a problem. There was, this was my view from the bow and this was going to be my view for the next 30 days. So I had to change my perspective as my ability to capture the changing nuances of waves in a drawing format were going to prove really tricky. So I decided to, to use the bathymetry or the multi-beam sonar data that was being collected as my muse. If I could not see anything, above the waterline, then I would draw what's below. I worked with PhD candidate Alicia Johnson and we formulated a plan that the drawing would be a snapshot of what the multi-beam was mapping for one hour between six and seven each day. And she would process the data for me and every day I would work from one of these images and create my own interpretation of what was ostensibly beyond the bow but ultimately hidden from view. Changing what some would see as a computer game style landscape into a visual narrative that has for the viewer a greater connection to the terrestrial panorama. These drawings are but a small part of my art practice and of what I produced during my time on board the Falcor. I also worked with pinhole photography in unconventionally documenting the no, a number of the data collection processes that were conducted during the journey. I have other video works in progress that I hope will give an alternative perspective on our effect on the ocean. As an artist, I want to make the science more accessible and help to shed light on the figures that can at times be overwhelming to the average person with no academic degree or inclination. And I hope through my investigations to give the viewer a window with which to question what's happening around them. And the final artwork that I wish to share with you opened the Jane Goodall Symposium in 2016. Gagged. Based on the words written by Carl Safina from Gaia the Plastic Ocean, 
which were pivotal in its creation. The adult abruptly pumps out several thick bulbuses of food, semi-liquefied squid and purplish fish eggs, which the chick bolts down. Both pause. The chick renews its drive for more. The adult arches her neck and is retching, retching. Nothing comes. More retching. Is something wrong? And slowly, the tip, just the tip of a green plastic toothbrush emerges in the bird's throat. The sight is surreal, so out of place, so wrong that my racing mind interrogating my eyes over and over. Are you sure that's a toothbrush? With her neck arched, the mother cannot pass the straight toothbrush. She re-swallows it several times, repeats the attempt to bring it up, and each time she cannot pass it fully out. To bring it home to us, you do not need to see the actual toothbrush to see the distress here. Unable to use its hands or arms to remove what is in its throat, there is so much current data about the ingestion of plastics by sea life, and particularly birds, that our emotions are becoming numb to the photographic image of another dead or dying bird with a stomach full of plastic pieces. Overloaded by these images, it affects our ability to respond. Our concern, dampened by this excess of information, makes it easier to look away. Ultimately, we understand the birds are not only gagged by our rubbish, but by the remoteness of place where these experiences happen, by their inability to understand that we humans have created a new debris that floats on the oceans, not of organic, but of indigestible rubbish. It is through art and artworks such as gag in its capacity to engage humanity in a more visceral way that can ultimately change, make change through a form of self-reflection. In the words of people like Pinar Yoldas that have driven my investigations beyond the purely academic or scientific worlds, we have complicated our relationship with life, our very human culture overrides nature. Our capitalist biomass manufactures mountains of e-waste, beaches of tar, rivers of zinc and oceans of plastic. And we are an army of plastic surgeons giving the planet a new face. Antarctica, this ain't no mirage. We see it upon a precipice of time, a point which will never come again, where we can all make a difference. I offer a few solutions, but hope by way of my visual interrogations to raise the viewer's consciousness. Thank you. I'm Christy Slade and I've got the rather daunting task of managing um, uh, questions for uh, Lee. Just, I should say that there was one rather remarkable, um, um, re well, remark from Eugenie Lumber saying fantastic lecture, but it is so different. And I, I wanted to start there. As with your Berlin deception, you bring an utterly unfamiliar um, perspective to familiar events, not as a scientist does, but as an artist does. Now, the language, your language of art, is almost incommensurable, totally untranslatable, I think, for some scientists. So the question I'm going to ask you is, how do you get on with talking to scientists as you're talking about your art? I mean, you're, I know you're talking to scientists here, but how do you get on with 
giving your conceptions through to the scientists you're working with? Oh, look, that's a, um, yeah, it's a really interesting question. And it's not, it's, it really just comes down to the scientists because there are those scientists that are excited and thrilled and happy to engage and work with artists. And I think that um, our language, uh, we can usually find a, an even meeting point. And it's really, come, it comes down to that open mind to, to uh, allow the interaction to start in the first place. I mean, there are those, both scientists and artists, that just will not work together and, and that's fine and that's, um, that's part of all their journey. But, um, yeah, for me, it's, it's been finding people who are really open to that collaborative process um, and, you know, I just wing it. <laughs> right. Well, th there we there we go. Look, there's a question here from Vaughan Massfield and Carla asking, how can we format this into a child accessible format? They are our ta target audience. The plastic penguins detritus could be a starting point. An animation would be amazing. Yes. Look, I think that that's it. I mean, you you're having to look at. Um, at what some artists do and trying to, I mean, I engage with the audiences when I exhibit the work and I've been trying to exhibit my works in university settings or in settings where there are access to schools so that I can engage with the student body themselves and talk to them about it. Um, and it's when they view things. So, you know, the, the penguin um, unhappy feet that was exhibited recently, well, not recently, nothing was done recently, uh, <laughs> COVID, um, but it was exhibited in 2018 in Perth um, at the uh, Edith Cowell University. And I was in, talking to a lot of the students there and they were really engaged. And what was so interesting was they didn't see the body parts that were in the negative space until you pointed to them and then they were really shocked that this negative space was there. I mean, I don't know how you would translate that side of it to children, um, build your own penguin from the inside out. Maybe not what most parents have in mind, um, but it's... Yeah, I mean, there are avenues that I think if you've got the right artist working with you and you've got the work that you can um, take time and, and um, work together to get something that the kids will really connect with. Interesting. Judith uh, Wielden asks, do scientists ever get inspired by watching you and begin some form of art themselves, art beyond recording and studying photos? Do they ever use art to express their own feelings and concerns? Look, they do, and there are a number of uh, um, scientists now that have jumped the fence, you could say, um, and that are producing art. Um, why, you know, there's a couple that I've known recently who um, have been studying marine biology and have now gone on to produce artworks um, in order to engage the audience in a different way. So uh, I know that on my trip that uh, with the Schmidt Ocean, that the way I was looking at our mapping did definitely um, change the perspective of certainly the scientists that I was working with, Alicia. Um, she, you know, we were looking at mapping in one way and they were looking at it as a completely holistic thing uh, for an end result to have the surface map, but my view was actually on the journey, the singular line of the journey that we ourselves were creating. So that then brought her back to saying, okay, well, maybe I can translate this in a different way. And she was very inspired by in changing the way that she was then visualising um, her science to other people. Lee, I've got a cheeky question. And it's this, you know, you're possibly quite rightly um, condemning the consumerists who are going to Antarctica and the Galapagos and the like. 
And I have to admit that I did many, you know, now 20 years ago or more, I uh, went to Antarctica and I've never seen anything better describe how I felt on the Drake's Passage than your drawing going up and down and up and down. But do you not feel that you as an artist or scientist in there are also intervening in that space? And as it were, perhaps it, you know, it's genuine wilderness, perhaps we should, should be all out or all of us keep out. Oh, that I actually agree with. Um, you know, I think that uh, there are places, there should be places on the planet that no one goes to. Not even, you know, just even nobody goes to. We just, we really do need to put a line in the sand and say we need to step away from this area and let it be. Unfortunately, human nature doesn't allow that. You know, we just want to keep sticking our fingers in the dike, so to speak. You know, we just want to keep touching and poking the bear and seeing what's going to happen next. Um, I do think, though, that there could be, you know, different ways to view going to some of these places. Antarctica, for instance, you know, I, I went to Deception Island and the debris there was, I found, quite confronting and, and really shocking that after all of this time, over 50 years, that some of the debris should have been removed and none of it is being removed and none of it is going to be removed. I mean, they're now selling it as, you know, the destination to go to, whereas I think that we could do something more like if you're going to take people there, then they have to work for that experience. They have to bring something back. You know, they have to bring that debris back. They can't just, because, I mean, that's what they keep saying is the bottom line. Oh, it's way too expensive to repatriate this land now. And, you know, it's been there long enough and it'll eventually go. But, you know, for 100 years down the track, you've still got whale bulk barrels, timber whale barrels, barrels still decaying in the sand of Deception Island, then I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. It's not like it's in a forest where the timber will be eaten away really quickly by microbes. This stuff is leaching for decades and to come. And I just think, you know, perhaps that's one way that we could look at interacting with these spaces is we have to engage with it and help it to keep it pristine. And just, just a final question, because I know we're running short of time, but do you really think, you, you talked, you, you say we should not just be told facts, but feel them. Do you think that that will really change our behaviours? Oh, I Well, I hope so. You know, <laughs> um, <laughs> I really do. I really hope so. I mean, you know, I think that if you feel something, you can make a change. If it connects with you emotionally, you are more prepared to change the way you do something because of that emotional connection. And I know that um, I've, I've shown gagged, um, you know, a number of times now, and I don't think that there is a time where I have told it, where, where I've shown it, where nobody is affected by looking at that work. And once you understand the text that it was based on, which I narrate, then, you know, I, I've met so many people who have said thank you for that work because it's changed the way they've done something. It's changed the way they're interacting. You know, I had one mother say to me, her son came home that afternoon and threw a plastic bag in the bin and she said, what are you doing? And he said, oh, well, I didn't eat that lunch. And she said, well, no, you'll get the plastic bag back out and you can use the plastic bag tomorrow because we're not throwing things away anymore. And it's just, it's that. It's changing one person's mind, it's changing how one person sees their space or their place or the way they interact. Um, and if everybody is just that one person who changes then it's a tidal wave of change. And, I mean, we are seeing it. Unfortunately, the powers that be in charge of us are a little bit devoid of that area, but perhaps we should throw gagged at them. <laughs> or more science, or more science. I'm or going to science. hand over now to Bruce to give the formal thanks, but thank you very much, Lee. Uh, thank you, Christine.
Thank you, Christy. And Lee, thank you for an absolutely fantastic um, presentation. I totally agree with Eugenie's Lumber's uh, description. You did a, a wonderful job. And in a presentation that I think is fairly unusual for the Royal Society, but probably we should have many, many more of. Uh, I certainly agreed uh, a lot with, uh, with a lot of your notions um, about the necessity for a holistic view of the world. And I think having more artists uh, presenting to the Royal Society to join with the, uh, the scientists who are at the moment still in the majority um, on the, in the society would actually bring about um, a much more vibrant society which could actually present a more holistic view. Um, one shouldn't be arts v science or science v arts. Um, in fact, the two go together very complementarily uh, and it would be nice to see much, much more of that. Um, unfortunately, scientific data has proved, well, the presentation of scientific data has proved to be pretty useless in persuading politicians and business people and, and other things that their sort of greed and exploitative ideas should be put down and that we should take time and a bit of energy to do something else. Certainly, I mean, if we actually took the time and thought about things, we could find a lot of solutions to the problems we have, including plastics. I mean, my own experience was uh, not physically seeing it myself, but being told while I was in, in France that, in fact, there are now microplastics coming down in the snow on the Pyrenees. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's everywhere, and it's probably even in Antarctic snow now. Yeah. Uh, so the age of the Anthropocene is well and truly totally global, um, and we need to do something about it. And your talk, your presentation, is certainly a wonderful step in the right direction. So I hope we see very many more of them turn up in, in society, you know, the society presentations. And I would like, on behalf of the society, to say thank you, Lee. That was absolutely terrific. So. Thank you, Bruce. So a, lot of, a lot of hand clapping, not just one hand, but a lot of clapping hands <laughs> from all, all of the attendees. Thanks, Lee. Thanks. Thanks very Thanks. much. It's been an honour. It's been oh. my honour. Oh, an honour for us. <laughs>